Hey everybody, I'm Hillary Atkin. I'm thrilled to welcome Dan Bukatinsky and Caroline Aaron to this edition of Hillary's Happy Hour. How are both of you doing? Mm, as well as everybody else, I think. I don't know how to answer that question, so I'm gonna say fine. <laughs> okay, well, last night, I got the opportunity to watch your movie, Call Waiting on Amazon Prime. And it must have a fascinating backstory because you shot it in 2004, 16 years ago. What happened? Why has it taken this long to get this wonderful one woman show that Caroline stars in to the screen, which I will point out for people who don't know, uh, Caroline, you performed in two different runs on stage and also I might add won a bunch of awards. But tell us, it's, it's got to be a fascinating story. I'm going to hand it over to you as our producer for sort of our history. Well, a little bit of the history, but you'll be able to fill in the parts about the play because a lot, um, because, um, a lot of what happened happened before we, we launched in this. The history of, of this play was that this, this fabulous playwright, Dory Fram, who we lost last year, and so this is all fortuitous in a way as, as, a, as a, a, a tribute to her, um, wrote this beautiful autobiographical story. And it's a one woman play that Caroline performed in Los Angeles. And, then, and, and it ran for a really long time. And Caroline and I have been friends forever. And, we, and my husband and I, Don, went to go see her in this tour de force performance on a stage where she was the only character in the play talking on the phone with 11 million people. And you come to know everything about this woman from her side of the phone conversation. And as we're leaving the theater and we hugged and kissed Caroline, we're getting in the car and I tell my husband, what if, I don't think anybody has ever made a movie with only one actor. I mean, maybe they have, but I've never seen one. And can you imagine if we made that play into a movie, but instead of breaking it open, like you do with almost any adaptation, we literally keep only one actor in it. We shoot it. And my friend, Jody Binstock, who was a, a rising female um, director at that time, was looking for something to do. And I thought, what if we just all put our heads together and Caroline does it and Dory and I adapt the play into a screenplay and Jody directs it and we just do it. My husband was like, we're not shooting an independent movie. I mean, we're not, but I was of that mood and he suddenly got intrigued by the challenge of it. And at like all good collaborations and all good creative ventures, oftentimes it comes out of a notion in your head that you say, what if? And we did it. We got together and we explored what it would be like to shoot one actor. And ultimately we, bro we broke it up a little bit by allowing Caroline to play two characters, but it was still only one actor in the whole movie. And we really loved the idea of telling this story of this woman, which was Dory's story. And then I wrote in addition to it, the story of the actress playing the role in a little bit of a French Lieutenant's woman, uh, uh, you know, tribute. So we, 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 we did it over the course of maybe a week, Caroline, right? And, and it was about 10 days, but one of the most interesting things that when Don, who's a brilliant filmmaker in his own right, and Dan, um, Don Ruse, Dan's husband, approached uh, Dory and myself about, would you be interested in taking this play and putting it on screen? One of the things that was explained to me is that, you know, when you go to the theater, you look at the, you look down at your program, you look at the set, you look at the head of the person sitting in front of you. And Don said, that's called editing. When you watch a movie, where you look has been decided for you and we need something to cut to. We can't just have the camera on one image and never go away from it. It will feel unnatural because we as human beings just do that naturally. We keep changing our focus. And so, you know, heads, thinking, thinking, thinking. And the next thing I know, Dan is writing another character. It, at the moment, I didn't know I would also be given the privilege of playing that too. He's writing this character of the actress playing the part. And one of the things that Dan challenged himself with was the original conceit of the play, which was this character would only be revealed by talking on the phone in the same way that the main character is only revealed by talking on the phone. And then what we found sort of magically, and I give our director credit for that, really all of us, you know, when something really works creatively, you can't tell 
where one person ends and the next person begins. It's only in show business that we partition people off. This is the actor, this is the writer, this is the director. I mean, really good directors know good ideas can come from anywhere, including craft services. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't, you don't have to be precious about your title, your job title, and no one in this collaboration was. Everybody was pitching and throwing things out and it was, um, it was pretty thrilling, I have to say. It was, and it was all in the spirit of that. Let's, you know, this is the thing, the spirit that we had back in 2004, and I had just made a movie for a very small amount of money that we made and we released it in 2001. I was very much in this mode that like, if, if we wanna do this, we just have to do it ourselves. What we didn't realize at that time, and, and it is a fact, it's just a fact of where we were. We, this, this movie was finished, it was cut together, it won a bunch of awards at the festivals. It was a story about a woman, written by a woman, about a woman, starring a woman, directed by a woman. At a time where women's stories, unless they were starring Meryl Streep or, you know, Julia Roberts, were not going to get, were not going to sell. We're not going to sell to a distributor or to a platform, to television. It was a very limiting time in, in show business. And our director, Jody Binstock, was an up and coming director who had just, directed this innovative film. And it was, while we did, were a darling at the festivals, it was very difficult to sell. And now here we are, who would have ever imagined, not only that Caroline Aaron, who is the star of our film and who has the, the most illustrious career of any of us, is now extremely, um, has, has, has achieved notoriety from her role in, in um, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is so fantastic and loved by all. And, I have been lucky enough in the last 10 years to have been on television in a bunch of shows and Scandal is, is one of them. And so it has helped in the time that this wine has been aging in a beautiful way. We have also reached a time when both of us have reached a certain kind of notoriety in our careers. We have also reached a time in, in show business where women's stories told by women, starring women, directed by women are being embraced. And last but not least, we've reached a moment in history where everyone can relate to the idea of being trapped in one's home. And that universality of experience has made this film more relevant now than it was when we, when we wrote it, when we made it. Absolutely. I mean, she was, you know, even when they first gave me the script and I was like, she's housebound. Why would that be interesting? What did she right. do all day? And me by the way. I do seven and a half months later, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've had to create that narrative for myself yeah. as with everyone else in the world. So there is also that overlap, which I think is pretty exciting. I, I think we, you know, we have a long way to go in terms of women's stories being as compelling as men's story, but Dan is right, you know, progress is incremental and incrementally over the last 10, 15 years, you know, women peaking out as the main event of any kind of storytelling experience is going to happen more and more. I really believe it. And being uh, relevant, and being cooped up for whatever reason, she was cooped. She's cooped up by her, by her um, yes. jealousy, by her cystitis, by physical limitations, by emotional blocks in her family. But all of us who have been quarantined now for months and months and stuck at home have now examined our lives. What's important? Have explored our family dynamics in a way that we haven't before. There's something about the story and this journey that this woman takes during this day in her life, stuck at home, that is very similar to this emotional journey that all of us are taking, where we've all been forced to stop and look at what's really important in our lives and look at where we, we might be able to repair re you know, relationships in our family. The story is very relevant now and touching and heartwarming and hilarious. And mostly because Caroline Aaron is probably the most capable, gifted and dynamic actress I've ever worked with. That's so sweet. Well, Dan, you know, you bring up some serious issues, but I'm glad you brought up some of the hilarious moments too. And I have to tell you, and it was a little bit of a blink and you missed it moment, but I'm very observant. So Caroline, when you got on the treadmill, you set the age to 80 and the <laughs> weight to zero. <laughs> I loved it. It was just one of those funny little things as she's moving around the house. To, I was like, oh my God, this is hysterical. And who amongst us in this pandemic hasn't bought home workout equipment like yeah. that? Because <laughs> we can't go to the gym anymore. Right. And it turns into a closet. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like all my sweaters. Yes. Are on, I know. So much I, of we'll go back. I mean, it will be very interesting to see how we re-enter, too. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot. You know, no, but so much of the business of how a person behaves in their home when they don't realize they're being watched and they're on the telephone and what they're telling somebody they're doing as opposed to what they're really doing, right. th that th it's a real study in business and props. I don't know how you do it. When I'm acting, I, if, if I could do a bedroom scene where I'm in bed and on scandal, 90% of the time I was, um, it was such a gift because I could just be in the moment and say my lines, but you do more in that movie physically yeah. than while you're acting. It's just, it's amazing. Well, you know, it the other amazing. thing is that, you know, how many times do people say, is this a good time when they call you? And who knows, you know what I mean? And like, we, if we, somebody we need to talk to or want to talk to, we go, great. Well, who knows what's really going on? Could just be the worst time in the whole world. I've been running out of the shower going, oh, great, great time. Do you know what I mean? And trying to get dressed with one arm. So right. I think there's also the fun of the private and public yes. being split um, with this movie. Yeah, well, Caroline, Dan brought this up, but you just play such a great role on, on um, Mrs. Maisel as Shirley Maisel opposite Kevin Pollack. And I know uh, season four is coming up. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything you can tell us about what we can expect and I want to congratulate you two years running SAG awards for best ensemble in a comedy series not to mention all the Emmy nominations the show has received and a huge awards magnet but let's hear more about Maisel what's going on well honestly it feels like you're being coy because if I didn't know what was going on of course I couldn't tell you but in of course case, I had to ask anyway sorry I of course you did. But you know what? In this case, I can be really honest. I don't know. And it's very interesting among this group of actors. Um, they don't really know until the last minute either. I, I mean, I think they have an idea story-wise of the big arcs of the story. But of course, I'm only interested in my story, really. Um, but last year, this was last year, you know, decades ago, it feels, you know, the first three seasons, they would have a launch party before we would start the next season. And Amy and Dan were there. And Maren Hinkle, the woman who plays the other mother and I were talking to Amy and she was giving us the broad strokes of this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen. And so then Tony came up, Tony Shalhoub, and I said, oh, guess what's gonna happen? He went, I don't wanna know. I don't wanna know, I don't wanna know. He doesn't wanna know until the week before. In this case, um, you know, it just depends on who you are as an actor. And so it is like opening a Cracker Jack box, the surprise is at the bottom. I really don't know what's gonna happen. I just said, they were very lucky, it was just a coincidence, that they ended season three with their, you know, with Midge, their main character, being fired and having to go home. I mean, if she'd been in the middle of a world tour, I don't know what they would have done for season four, but they are gonna pick up season four that in the most compatible way with the time in which we are now, which is her big world that she had just made herself a part of has now been shrunk back down again. And she's gonna have to reboot. That's all I know so far. And that's really the, the absolute truth. I know everyone wants to go back to work um, really badly. And I, the only other thing I can tell you is when this all came up, I thought, how are they gonna do Maisel? Because it's a show with such scope. And I know how important that is to the creators. And Amy Sherman Palandino said, this is the story of a woman who um, meets the world and I'm not changing that. Because I thought, are we all gonna be in the kitchen and talking about each other's cooking? You know what I mean? Stuff that you could do pandemic friendly. And Amy said, no, she's not gonna do that. So I have no idea. You know, you have to remember this show has been to Paris and to Miami and to the Catskills. I mean, this is, this is part of their narrative is taking somebody from a sheltered life into the world, the same way the country was, was growing up at the same time that it takes place. So, you know, if anybody can pull that off, during this time, I think it's that duo. That's all I can tell you. For sure. Okay, well, Dan, one of your shows that you've worked on, you've worked on, I, I don't know how many dozen episodes, but who do you think you are? The genealogy show. Yes. And I'm curious, what were some of the most interesting things that came out of that experience? <laughs> Oh my goodness. We've been fortunate enough to do 10 seasons of that show. We're in the middle of shooting 
our new season that's going to come out on NBC whenever we're allowed to finish it. Um, but over the years, I mean, the great thing about that show is that no episode is like any other. Someone's personal family history is exactly what it was. We don't write it. We only d uncover it. We discover it. And there have been so many. I can't say I have necessarily a favorite. I know Rita Wilson's. I don't remember what season it was. Um, they're all available now. Uh, I can't. Uh, I can't remember what app they're on, but I saw a good portion of all these episodes of Who Do You Think You Are? All these unbelievable journeys of discovering your ancestry. Um, Spike Lee and uh, Regina King and um, Lisa Kudrow, who's the first one who did it. She's my partner and she did the first one. And sometimes you're coming face to face with, a rel with a, an old relative you didn't even realize you had. And sometimes you're being faced with a lineage that goes back 500 years. And in the case of Courtney Cox and Brooke Shields, that certainly was the case. But we've had stories that have brushed up with politics and the law and murder. And, you, you know, there's nothing like the real thing in terms of drama and scandal and and where we come from and how that shapes who we are but the most exciting thing about that show are the 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 coincidences the things like josh groban's episode where the things you find 200 years before that tie you to the thing you chose in your own life years later that you, when you see echoes of who you are and somebody who existed you know generations before it's thrilling and it's the goosebump moments that lisa and i are always looking for on, on that show and we're very excited to to bring more because we have some great episodes coming up whenever they let us finish Never. All right, talking about things coming up, Caroline, you're such a, a part of the New York theater community. And it was recently announced that Broadway lights are not gonna go up until the end of May, which is so disappointing, but what what sort of feeling uh, are you getting from the theater community about, about this? Well, I, I, it's, you know, it's a very sad situation in a way in that all the ancillary people who work to make that magic happen, particularly the costumers, the set designers and stuff like that. You know, it's like in a lot of jobs and there's so many people whose work has been sidelined, but you can't think like in my building as an example, is the woman who is the head seamstress for Wicked. And when you have a long running show where there's lots of costumes, you have constantly, she is constantly repairing things, remaking things, recutting things. And she's just shut down, you know, and, and it will be a year or two years without any income. And I was talking to this designer, a lighting designer, and she said, it's kind of a tragedy in the theater community. She has a team of people. She's won like eight Tony Awards. And she said, I'm very lucky because I was the lighting designer for Frozen. And she said, now they're going to open in Australia because Australia seems to be ahead of us in able and being able to have large gatherings. And she said, so I could put my team to work. And I was really excited and she went, but I'm trying to figure out a way to have a fundraiser or something so these people can hang on. Well, I'll tell you, the actors, the, the actors Fund, which is a great, uh, a really, really good um, uh, charitable organization is raising money to help those who have lost income because of this. And I certainly recommend that as a, as a great cause to donate to these days. I know this is a happy hour, so I'm going to toast to the both of you. If oh, I think we're ready, Dan. We're I'm ready, ready to, toast, to toast with my whatever my mystery beverage is in my mug. Um, but yeah. also, Basil's on Amazon. We're so excited that Caroline's movie, Call Waiting, is also available on Amazon. So when you're on there buying your bulk paper towels, you can watch Maisel. You can also look for Call Waiting and watch it and enjoy this tour de force performance. Um, I highly recommend it. And I want to thank you so much meeting you guys on Zoom, taking you. time out and wishing you much success moving forward. Thank you, Hillary. Thanks, thanks Hillary. Thank Bye you. Everybody. Salute. 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 Everybody. Mm -hmm.